you have put yourself out there, right? Like it, it, yeah, definitely. It's very healing in a way for people when they go through something, whether it's adverse, adversity or a trauma. Um, you yeah. know, you've got certain people that put themselves out there to share yep. their stories um, and to kind of have a really strong message. But we don't often talk about like the taxing toll of what yeah. it takes um, because you're often not ever getting paid. You do yep. this for the determination that you don't want anyone else to go through it. But yep. what kind of is the toll of putting yourself out there in advocacy? Well, I think... It's just, it's definitely a mental toll because something that I've noticed is you carry other people's pain and you're always expected, I guess, naturally it's like you're always empathetic, like you always feel. But I guess when you have, when you open yourself up to a platform like I have, it's just, it's always constant that sometimes it also becomes a bit numbing. But yeah, it's like, it's just, it feels quite repetitive and like you want to be, I guess, as available as possible. But if you've got like, say, five people per week coming and telling you they've been diagnosed with whatever form of cancer, you're also like, like a part of me is like, I take responsibility because it's like, I don't want to point you in the wrong direction of telling you anything wrong because like, that's not my job. Like if I tell you that I'm on this medication because it works for me, it's not me that's going to work for you, right? Or I point you in sources, like to sources of support, it could be not what you need. So there's definitely like that kind of responsibility that I feel. And I'm always very conscious of that. And like, sometimes it's also, and this is going to sound so bad, but like when people come to me and they're like, oh, I've been diagnosed with like stage 1A melanoma, which just pretty much means they're just cutting it out of their skin and they're completely terrified. A part of me is like, I wish I had one. <laughs> exactly. Like, I don't want to be a bitch, that's but like, I'm, no, that's such I'm, I'm natural. I'm like, yeah, I get that you're scared, and yeah, it's yeah. it's terrifying to be told you have any form of cancer. But I'm like, that's like fine. Like yeah. if they got it and they're confident and they got margins, I'm like, you're okay. Like it's not the yeah. end of the world. You don't need to like you know freak out on the level that you're freaking out. No, you're gonna you're be not, okay. You're not stage four. You're not dying. Exactly. You you're don't. Okay. Yeah, like it's a blip. Like, you're going to forget about it, that you even, like, you not forget about it, but, like, you're not going to be hung up on it and it's not going to be a part of your life for the rest of your life. Like, you're going to be worried about it for about a year and then hopefully you're going to grow past it and you won't be, like, stuck on it. Whereas, like, anything yeah, more than, like... What does stage four look like? Like... Exactly. That's another thing. Like, I don't look like I have stage four cancer. I always tell this to everyone. Like, I walk down the street and I'm perfectly healthy. But on my insides, I have these fucking tumours that just won't go away. <laughs> so, yeah, and that's another thing that I'm really, like, passionate about trying to, I guess, teach people is that illness doesn't have an image and that this is something that we really have to hone in on is that we have been taught from such a young age that illness, disability, chronic illness, all of it is meant to look a certain way. If you're like, it's really shocking, but if you tell some, ask someone, what do you think disability or illness look, looks like? They'll tell you it's a bald head and it's someone in a wheelchair. And it's like, that's not right. Like that's how with society, we've done a complete disservice to like what this is. And it frustrates the shit out of me. Mm -hmm. But I guess that's what I've taken on my role as well. It's like, well, I'm trying to teach you that no, not everything is what you've been taught. There's so many more levels to it. And we've really got to restructure and reframe the way that we think. And, and I think as well, you know, science and medicine has progressed to such a level that yeah. we can keep very sick people looking well for longer. Oh, for sure. Um, like, hello, yeah. in the media, like the Black Panther, um, Chadwick Boseman, nobody knew he had stage four cancer, right? Because you don't have to look like you have cancer to have stage four cancer. Uh, did you see all the social media posts that people were saying that he looked like yeah. a drug addict or he looked like... Yeah. And, and I was going, you know, you do actually go there at places. If you don't know someone's story, you, you might don't. be like, oh, such, yeah. such looks tired. She's had a big night or such. You know what I mean? Yeah, like you exactly. That's why I think we've always got to lead with compassion and empathy yeah, sure. in health. Yeah. Because yeah you know some people's illnesses are not face value not at all not at all um and and i think you know you're playing such an important role in 
changing the face of stage four cancer. Well, yeah. And like, it's just, it blows my mind because every time that like, I'll go to a new GP or I just meet a medical professional, they're like, even they are like caught in their own, like internalized ableism be like, you don't look sick. And I'm like, huh, look at my rap sheet. I am. <laughs> <laughs> You feel like, really, it is a rap shit in the heart. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Uh, but how does it make, you know, because obviously you've got a partner and he's been yeah. but, um, right by your side through the whole process. And often, you know, when you live with someone like my husband, you know, he sees more than my parents do at times. Um, yeah. The suffering, the anxiety, the mental health issues. You know, what what kind of impact does that have on on a caregiver oh. or someone and especially someone young yeah well the whole thing is is like with alexander this whole our whole lives got changed like we had barely met each other when i found out that i was sick again because when he came to australia he didn't have a job i was the only person he knew and he was home all the time so he actually found a hobby to try and i guess one keep him busy and something that he can connect with because he and I, we both like, and I guess this is what happens when illness enters your life. You question everything constantly. You're always like, well, what's the fucking point of everything? So we both were in like a level of cynicism, which was so intense that we're just like, I don't see the point of even like enjoying a beautiful day because you have this annoying rain cloud that's gonna, that's always on top of you, no matter what the weather is. So he turned to cooking and like, eventually I always have my writing, but that's not to say like, it's never, it helps, but it never truly like, you know, overtakes it. And as a carer for him, like he in the position of a carer for me, something that I always feel, and I think this is something that everyone who has cancer can relate to is that always this heaviness, like this guilt that you're putting this person that you love through a horrible ordeal. And I always say to him, I feel so intensely that I took you away from your family or that, you know, you're having to experience all these horrible feelings and these anxiety and sleepless nights because of me. And it's an up and down relation, like anything, it just goes up and down and it's painful. But he always assures me that it was his decision. He was like, I chose to come to Australia. I chose to stay here. I chose you. And I'm like, I appreciate that and I think that's amazing and I'm always very grateful and I completely understand that. But then also on top of that, I'm always like, yeah, but I'm like, fuck, it's a lot. Mm -hmm. Like, it's like, I just like, I wish that like sometimes it would just like, I don't know, I could just like send him back home or we could go home with him like every three months and it could just like, you know, there would be kind of like a little bit more equal because right now all the scales are like tipped in my favor and it gets so tiring to constantly have to talk about me and my health and always have my health put first and it's like sometimes I just love a week where I don't have to do it but that never happens because like we can't for example like planning to go traveling is a nightmare even if it's just in New South Wales because you've got to book it around treatments and you've got to like make sure if any if you're having a bad week you can't go anywhere too far you got to check if there's a hospital and like all the nightmare so it's like like I said it's a heavy relationship but it has its ups and it definitely has its downs but I think what's a testament to us is that we've always said that we're very honest with each other and that's how we make it through like we're very straight up if we're like no I don't want to talk about it or not it's just too much of a day or we just need to take time out and I think that's the only way you can get through something like this is with being completely honest. Because if you internalize all your feelings with something as shit as cancer and it's like hard to navigate, you're not going to get anywhere. No. So, yeah. Uh, and, you know, how, you know, I guess when you're so young, mm. you, you network and work and do you feel like you get, how, how has that impacted kind of your work and your friendships and your life? Like it would have well, changed. Oh, for sure. Like I have gone through friends like a pair of jeans, I suppose. <laughs> it's just like you find the ones that fit and stay and hug you when you need to. But then there are the ones that just don't fit anymore because you've grown out of them. Yeah. And that's literally how this affects your friends is because some people 
even if they've been exposed to illness in their lives, sometimes they just can't cope with it again or they just can't compute. And that's completely fine. But one thing that I've come to really appreciate is like if people just tell you up front. And I think that's the most important thing is like if someone can just tell you to your face, I can't deal with it. And I'm like, I'd much rather you tell me than ignore me for four and a half months mm. and then all of a sudden pop up because you feel guilty. It's like, no, just just be honest with me, right? Yeah. Like that would be the best thing. But it's hard, like with work, I can't work. And that's another annoying thing. As much as I want to you know, get out there and start a career, it's kind of like, well, cancer gets in the way and it constantly gets in the way. And the it's workplaces like that... It's like a full-time job, right? Yeah, what? like I, there's no way that I could get a full-time job. Like not that not saying that I don't want to. It's also just like the fatigue and like the unpredictability of what I have. It's like if I get a bad diagnosis or a bad side effect, I have no idea how long that's going to put me out for. And it's just not fair in a workplace. And I totally get that I'm a liability. Like it just, it doesn't make sense to hire someone who may or may not be able to do the full-time hours. So that in itself is very frustrating. And so it's had to, I guess, make you creative in how you can get money. But it's shit because it's like, you don't have the energy to want to do anything, but you're like, I need to pay my bill. So that's really hard. Yeah. You're such a brilliant writer, Nat. Like you, Thank you, you. And, and I think, you know, cancer has given you even more to write about in a way and an yeah. understanding of the human form and suffering. And I think so. Yeah. It's like the way that you write is just from a place of true vulnerability i think but yeah with an I think truth yeah element to it as well which i love yeah <laughs> no i definitely agree like um i was speaking with my psychologist yesterday and she said it's not a gift that everybody wants but you definitely have wisdom that a lot of people spend their whole lives looking for and yet you got it when you were 20 so it's like it's true it's like that is like the one payoff <laughs> out of all of this is that I definitely have perspective and it's definitely like it's definitely helped me I think in like my ability to where I need to spend my energy because like there's a lot of instances where I'm like that six years ago would have got me completely riled up but right now I'm like no that's not worth it Le yeah leave it be so definitely I guess that is one thing where it's like and, I, and people always say oh cancer gives you an epiphany and it's like Yes, it definitely does. But like, would I trade it to not be sick? Yeah, I think anyone would. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. And, and, you know, where would Natalie be if she didn't have cancer? What do you think you'd be doing now? I reckon I would probably kind of in the same field in the sense of I'd definitely be a writer. I've always envisioned myself as like being an editor for some online digital publication, something funky, something fun, something where my personality shines. I've always thought that I, that's where I'd end up. Um, so I think that's where I would be. I definitely wouldn't have met Alexander. This is something that we always talk about. Cause like if I wasn't sick, I wouldn't have changed any degrees and I wouldn't have gone in exchange and I wouldn't have like met Alex in Venice. So that would have been, yeah, that's something really strange to think about is like I would never have crossed paths with him and he's like the love of my life. So I'm like, I don't know where I would be in my love life. Probably just, you know, fine being signal, which is absolutely okay. <laughs> Not an issue. But yeah, like I just, it's interesting. It's like... Finds the love of their life. That's your novel, Natalie. Yeah, no, I know. It's like my friend told me literally the other week, she's like, fuck, when are people going to make a movie about you? Because you have a really like, you have a cinematic life. And I'm like, I know, it's actually quite funny. Because like when you really put everything together on a timeline, it's like, it's perfect for a Hollywood movie, right? Like it's got all the Get highs and lows. Get right in I know. <laughs> I know, I have to really get cracking on that. 
yeah, and, and write in the third person and it will it will make its way to Hollywood. I a hundred percent Yeah, I have a thing that like Reese Me the Spoon's gonna pick it up for her book club and then she's oh. gonna sign the rights and then no it's just that's my we'll thing. Yeah, her. like that's exactly how it's gonna work. Yeah. I'm like manifesting it. <laughs> it's like when I wrote my book and they were like, Who who do you want to launch your book? And I was like, yeah. well, Oprah or the Prime Minister's wife? <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> just a little bit, little bit busy. <laughs> I'm the first lady of Australia, just not the first lady of the universe. <laughs> That's okay. Look, we'll take that. That's a win. <laughs> what? Like, navigating the healthcare system, like, it is so overwhelming. Like, I think yeah. so many things. I think we're so lucky, like in Australia, we've got such privilege. Oh, far out. Yeah, huge. That we do. So we can't sit here and complain about a health system. No way. But I think it's very confusing and complex to navigate. And I think it's like that around the world. Um, And if you have a lot of money, you get the best of everything around the world, right? Um, Yep. Have you seen anything that you think could be improved in the healthcare landscape? Oh, well, I think it would be really, well, what absolutely blows my mind is that when you have a, especially like a stage four cancer diagnosis, it's such, it's so hard to get government like funding in the sense of just some help with money. And I've always found it incredible that, cancer there is such a fine line as to whether it's called a disability or not because some people consider it a disability whereas others don't and I've always found that that's really really interesting because I was like if you are handed a stage four diagnosis it's like 90% incurable you're like you either live with it or you die from it and it's like insane that you have to jump through hoops Mm. to I know get 200 bucks a fortnight from the government to help you live and pay your bills so that in itself is crazy but i think also maybe i think that it would be really imperative if there was some kind and i know the cancer council offers it and stuff but it's like it's quite hard to get to but i'm like solid counseling sessions for your carers and your parents and your family members like actual like people with like repetitive um care in a sense it's the same person every time because I know you can call up a number and talk to someone and like I I, like I don't want to diss that that's so important but I do know that continue like that continuum with having one person and establishing a relationship is really important because like for my partner Alexander who just got Medicare it's still a chunk of money every fortnight or when he has to go and he just got the ability to go and it just blows my mind because that's always what hinders people from going to see a psychologist is the cost. Yeah. And it's like, and I can say, speak for that firsthand. Like I myself would like, if I couldn't afford it, I wouldn't go. And so I feel like that it just blows. It's great that my hospital offers it, that I get, I get access to a psychologist now, but it would be amazing if hospitals in that sense could offer it like as a whole package kind of thing. But of course, that's just my opinion. And I do know there's completely 100 million avenues you have to go through to get anything like that to work. But I think that because overall cancer, I think that one way that you're able to deal with it is to talk about it. So immediately I just think about that kind of care is what you can't, we need to implement and have it ex- as accessible as possible. Yeah, that ability to talk say- to people. Yeah, they always say that it's not one person that gets cancer, it's the whole family, right? Exactly. It's when you're having a bad day, they'll have a bad day. Like, it's completely... For sure. Um, if you love someone, you care about how they feel, right? So yeah. The mental health toll and the emotional toll on families. And I, I think especially young, like whether it's children, young adults. Yeah, for um, sure. You're meant to be at the prime of your life. Like kids yeah. aren't meant to get cancer. No, right? no, Young far adults out, no meant to be Traveling and doing everything that you know your parents have wanted you to do. Um, yeah, get a career, earn some money, fall in love. Yeah, like yeah, exactly. And then you get cancer, and it's like everything that you would probably plan just went out the window. Um, 
yeah and like you're you're having to navigate something that something that I've always said is like my parents couldn't even help me with Mm. so it's like usually you'd always turn to your parents when you were young about money about love about all kinds of things like what's your advice and it was kind of this shocking moment where it was like I can't even ask my mum and dad for help and that's what really like sunk in and made this like even more unbearable is that I had to really learn to do it on my own and figure out my own sources of support go down the google rabbit holes and try and find you know sources of support and like it took me a long time to make friends with people with cancer because I was terrified like I genuinely was so scared not because I didn't want to make friends is because I could not stand the thought of having friends that died I just couldn't handle it and I was so scared of like befriending people and having people who knew exactly what I was going through but I just for some reason I just couldn't bring myself to join support groups or find people my own age because I was just like if they tell me that they have a horrible diagnosis excuse me a horrible diagnosis I just I feel it so heavily that I was like I kind of wanted to save myself from having more pain which is so selfish but like I just couldn't deal with it so it took me literally like five years to gain the courage to like actually find people my age and actually talk to them and now that of course like I have them I love them and like they're my closest friends but a part of me is absolutely fucking terrified that it's like if they get a relapse or if they, they're still stage four like I am and they don't get good news, it's like, I don't want to have to start attending funerals, but that's the reality of this disease is that I'm going to have to. Yeah, so, and, and you probably see yourself in them as well. And that probably exactly. scary for you. Yeah, um, it's like, it's something like, I'm always thinking about my funeral and I know that's so morbid, but I always like something triggers me and I'm like always thinking about it. And like part of me thinks of it in humor because I'm like, oh, oh who are the dumb funeral is it? That's the question. Yeah, well, that's the thing. Like it changes every day. <laughs> what, what is it? Like, is it? Oh, I'm like, is it like, of course I want it to be happy and uplifting and everything, but I always think of like morbid moments of like Alexander just standing there crying, but then half of me, like, which is horrible and like my family and everything. And that's like the hard part of my funeral. But then I always think of the funny part in my head where I'm like, well, who are the bitches who tuned, who, turned, who turned up? Who I'm like, no, we're not friends, but how dare you come to my funeral? Like I always think of that. And I'm like, what does that say about you me? You are writing a book, and that's going to be it because I like, I can imagine a funeral like that. You and I'm like, I'm there, like in my spirit, being like, "Fuck you for coming! Like, how dare you?" Come here? <laughs> oh my god that's so, yeah. So, yeah. Like, you have to have a sense of humor right with anything that you do uh, yeah life, stuff because otherwise it breaks you like in a room oh for sure yeah it's... and like I've been there like at the complete bottom of the well broken and like you have to laugh sometimes because like I've just gotten this, like, Alexander and I so used to this saying of just, like, of course it fucking happened to me. Like, if something goes wrong and wrong again and wrong again, I'm just, like, I had to sit there and I'm just, like, oh, fucking course. Because it's just, like, it's comical in a way. And then I'm just, like, you know what? Okay, fine, I'll take it. But I'm not going to let it completely define me. Like, no way. We're going to keep fighting. We're going to, you know, all that kind of stuff. But, like, yeah, you have to laugh have sometimes. Not at all. You have pushed. Nah pushed and pushed and that really yeah. does symbolize like being the CEO of your own body or being your own yeah. because you haven't just listened to the doctors and not pushed for what's right for you um like you you have really pushed do you think you would have got the clinical trials that you have and like if you hadn't have been had that fight in you Probably, oh, that's a really good question. I don't know. I think it's part you and your, because like I always say there's this one defining moment when you get told you've got cancer and it's like, it's like a three second window in your brain, whether you are like, fuck, I'm going to like, all right, I'm going to let it defeat me. Like I have no choice. Or you're like, no, I'm not going to accept it. I'm going to refuse and like to say that this is it. 
it's like literally I'll never forget that and I was like I was sitting in my oncologist's office it was a different oncologist because it was only like stage three last time but I was like I remember thinking and I'm like no I'm like I refuse to accept that this is it and I feel like if you have that mentality but also it comes in with if you've got a really good oncologist and I got really lucky because you need to have an oncologist that you can be so honest with and someone who advocates for you so if you have that it's a marriage and that's how I think I've got like to be able to get to this clinical trial because like Dr Carlino he was just like we were meant to go on a certain one and then he goes no 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 I think this one's the best one and he's just like I do know I've heard stories where oncologists don't listen to their patients mm. and it's it's terrifying where people where they push they think they oh you should go on a certain this this drug or maybe we should hold off and they're not listening to their patients and that terrifies me and so I definitely think that I'm lucky because again Australia's healthcare is really like up there and it's amazing but it's also I was so lucky to land the oncologist that I have that we're able to talk about these things I'm able to push and he pushes as well and then that's where we end up together I feel like you need to live in the moment as we get so caught up in planning and like what out like our next week's going to look like and what we want like the whole five-year plan and it's all fucking bullshit because you never know what's going to happen tomorrow like you seriously just need to live in right now enjoy what you have laugh when you can cry when you want because I like I say to my yeah. friends right I'm like you may be sick and you may be at whatever stage of illness you are I could walk out tomorrow and get hit by a bus <laughs> like you know literally though it's always that example but it's so true like, <laughs> the bus is getting everyone <laughs> but it's true like and it's it's crazy because like in the morning before you get told that you're sick everything's fine right everything's normal you're like completely running exactly how you've always been taught how to run and all it takes is just three words to completely change your life and it's like it doesn't just have to be those three words though because it doesn't have to happen to you. It could happen to your brother, your mum, your dad. Someone you love could get severely hurt, get ill. And like, this is the thing. It's like life, it's so dumb to plan it all the time because it's what's unplanned is what affects you the most. And like, that's obviously what you can't prepare for. And that's why you need to live in the moment. And that's why you need to cherish everything. That's why you need to go to the doctor if something feels funky so you can get it checked for sooner rather than later. Because even now in COVID, I think I was reading an article this morning, the numbers of people who aren't getting things checked, like the number of cancer diagnoses are so low, it's actually kind of scary. And so who knows what's going to happen in the next six months, what those numbers are going to look like yeah. when it gets to stage three and stage four, and there aren't going to be enough treatment options and things were left too late. And it's so annoying because you are your own advocate, right? You are the one who is able to walk on your two legs or whatever your wheelchair to get yourself to the to the doctor and talk to your doctor about what's wrong and it's like how can you be so silly or naive to not want to do that because oh it's going to take me half a day to do it your health is the most important thing that you have if you don't look after it you don't have a car silly. you don't have a job you don't have a house but you don't have no you have problems. nothing you have nothing yeah you have nothing without your health and like it's something that like, I hate that I'm like the poster child for that, I guess, in the community that I've built, but like, and I hate that I always have to remind people, but also I'm like, you know what, fine. I will remind you constantly that like, this is my life is what you could have if you don't look after yourself. And like, and the thing is, that's, it's, that's it. It is. But I think, you know, your mum and you did the right things like you, you this is true as well yeah so true you did try to get answers um yep and you know i've spoken to a lot of people um that are a part of the humanized health um kind of community is that a lot of them tried to get answers a lot of them did the right yep. thing they still got told yep. oh, nothing to worry about and it's like trusting that gut trusting your intuition there is data that says that women especially are the best the cia says they're the best spies because they have such yeah. intuition i was like i oh. would not put it past that for sure <laughs> <laughs> my it's so true though because like that's how i knew something was off it was in my gut i was like something's wrong when I was overseas and when I had all those bruises that happened that led me to going to the doctor's office, I was like, 
intuition told me it had to do with that mole. It was crazy, but it was literally, it was my gut saying, nah, you've got to go get this, go checked again. And look what happened. Like, of course it was shit, right? It was a very, very shit prognosis. But if I had left it, it would have been even worse. And I always have to remind myself of that. I was like, it could have been worse. So, yeah. You're amazing, Nat. Like, I know you, you probably get <laughs> told, told that all the time. Um, and you probably don't think you're special. Um, but I think it does. Sure, I don't. I think it takes a lot of guts and a lot of um, self-sacrifice to share your story and to put yourself out there. I think people think it's self-serving in a way sometimes. People are like, oh, you know, yeah. look at her. She's out here doing this or she's in an event talking. I'm like, you guys. Absolutely not, it's, man. It's not. The trauma. You yeah. relive it every time. And this is something, again, like this is what you're coming to, like the responsibility of sharing your story is you relive your trauma every time you talk about it. Okay. And like psychologists tell you that you have to try and move on from it. Right. And then here you are, you make a career out of it. And you're like, well, <laughs> what fucked up damage am I doing to myself? <laughs> but it's like at the end of the day, like I'm saying, it's not for me. Like this isn't for me to gain. It's like, okay, great. I'm part of me. Yeah. I'm making a career out of it. I'm changing people's lives. I'm saving lives, but that's my goal, right? I want to save lives. I want to educate. And I think that's everyone who enters this space is that we all have the same goal. We all want to save lives. And that's what we, we do, right? Something. And I think it's, yeah. it's the ultimate goal is to um, not live forever, but has, have something that does. Um, exactly right I've become obsessed with like try, like leaving my mark on the world yeah. like I think that's just something that's so normal when you're so sick it's just like fuck I want to be remembered how am I going to do it I'll do whatever it takes because you're so aware that it's like it's gone in a blip so yeah that's exactly right and I guess that's exactly why you do what you do you I do what I do is you don't want people to have to feel that way right because that's a shit feeling when you realize that your body fails you. It's probably one of the worst feelings in the world. And it's a tug of war every single day. And it's like something out of your control. Yeah. Well, Hum, thank you so much for your time because I know like yeah. it's not it's not easy being you sometimes and <laughs> it's true. But that's all good. <laughs> no, that's all good. I'm more than happy to chat to you. I'm so grateful I got to like make it work. True. But thanks, Han. Like all No, thank you.